Okay, thanks for uh, your patience in this. So, my name is Matthias Straas. Um, I'm an independent software consultant from Belgium. I uh, advise companies mostly on um, projects that have a lot of complexity. So I help them with modeling, analysis, um, quality assurance, uh, often refactoring, these kinds of things. Um, so if you were hoping for a programming talk, I'm afraid this one is not it. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about things like event sourcing, but not from the code point of view, but just from the modeling point of view. Um, so I'd like to start by asking, uh, who knows you models before you um, build something? Are you actually at a whiteboard, making drawings, making diagrams, uh, collaborating with people, with domain experts perhaps? So raise your hand if you do any of these activities. Okay, quite a few people. Well, the secret is, the secret is in fact that everybody uh, is always modeling. You're always mentally modeling problems. When somebody explains a problem to you, you're imme immediately building this sort of model in your head. The problem, of course, if you're not visualizing, is that nobody can verify it. You have no idea if this is even close to what um, the person speaking to you intends. Uh, they also have a mental model. So you're sort of trying to synchronize these, these models without um, having some way of validating that. So this is something that, that uh, interests me a lot. Um, so what are great models? Um, people tend to think sometimes, especially in domain-driven design, that it's about making um, a realistic representation of reality, an accurate representation. But that's not the point. That's helpful, that's a heuristic, that's a, a tool that we can use to, to verify our model. Does this sort of match reality? Um, but the point, of course, is to make some abstractions that are useful, that help us to solve uh, problems. Uh, George Box once said, he was an engineer in the 50s, he said something like, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, so that's our way to validate if a model is uh, is in fact, well, the right one. It's not right, it's just the best one we can come up with that is practical and helps us uh, to solve problems. So in this talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we model things. And most of what we do is actually uh, structural modeling. We, we visualize things. Um, we visualize the structure of our system by uh, drawing boxes probably with all the, all the things that we have and maybe the relations between the things and maybe we will annotate it a little bit with, uh, with some behaviors, but uh, we're not really modeling how this system behaves over time. And so this talk is uh, basically me trying to convince you that um, there's another way of modeling called temporal modeling, where we're trying to visualize how the system will actually behave over time, uh, how it evolves, and uh, I will try to show that this uh, will help us to find uh, problems that usually only turn up late in, uh, in production. So there's one um, heuristic that I got from, uh, also from Weinberg's book. So if you've never heard of Gerald Weinberg, he, is, uh, he was a programmer at uh, IBM in the 50s, I think. And he's, uh, uh, he's still writing books. He wrote about 50 books on software, and software quality, uh, even the psychology of software programmers, uh, on systems analysis. Um, so, uh, well, I would advise you to read some of that. So this is from a book called Rethinking System Analysis and Design. And he talks about how processes in systems, so it's both li it's living organic systems, it's uh, also man-made systems. He's talking about systems in general. And he says there's this pattern of processes in systems that always occur, being, behaving, and becoming. So being is about how the, the system maintains its own structure the work that the system does to stay the way it is, right? It's, it's the morphology, it's the, the constancy of the, of the system. Um, behaving, of course, is how it reacts to inputs. It's, uh, very often these are things that are repeatable or reversible. It's things that you do to the system all the time. It's sort of the normal operational things of, uh, of the system. Very often this is sort of the purpose of the system, to do these kinds of things. And then the third is uh, becoming. It's how the system evolves, it's how it changes, it fundamentally changes into something else, how the structure actually becomes some completely different structure. Um, it's, it's the learning, it's the history uh, of, of the system. So these three Bs, uh, being, behaving, becoming, they're not uh, patterns in the sense that you would have design patterns. You're not going to build a system by thinking, okay, I need a, I need a being pattern here. Not at all, but they are heuristics. They can help you to look at your system, at your design, at your analysis, 
and ask yourself, have I uh, thought about all three of these? Are these applicable? You can talk to the domain expert or the customer and ask questions about this. Like, okay, this system, uh, you described what it looks like, what it's structured like, but how will it behave? Uh, do we expect this to change in the future? So these are heuristics that I like to keep sort of in the back of my head when I'm uh, trying to analyze um, well, business problems. Most of my clients, it's, it's typical line of business applications. So, um, so and this is well, this is sort of a, a an, uh, well, simplified version of the, the typical drawings that you're probably making. It's very structural. It's boxes and arrows, uh, entity re relationship diagrams. They're very focused on the artifacts and not on how this behaves. And this is, I feel this is uh, damaging. And I will try to illustrate this with a very uh, extremely simple example. So uh, who has heard of BDD, Behavior Driven Development? Okay. Using tools like BHAT probably in PHP. So very often we write stories like this. And of course it is very simplified here, just to make a point. So as a shopper, in order to buy stuff, uh, given I have a product X with a price 100 euros, when I probably buy something, etc., etc. So I want you to observe for a moment now your own thinking process. I imagine that most of you already now at this point have some sort of mental model where this is probably some object or some table called product with some attribute in there called uh, price. Um, is this the right model? Well, there is no right or wrong model. There's useful models. But we have been influenced. Uh, by the way that this person has told this story. If somebody had told us this story first, as a shop owner, in order to sell stuff, given I have a product X, and that product is priced 100 euros in the pricing table. If this was the first story, I suspect that most of you would have had a different model straight away, a different mental model, where you had two tables. One would be products and the other could have been prices with maybe some relationship between those. Um, now, a pricing table is not a, a database table at all. A pricing table is just some document that a shop owner can use to you know, maybe uh, make strategic decisions about prices so they, they wouldn't have to look at each product individually, but they can look at, okay, this category of products has these prices and maybe I'll do some promotion on these prices. Um, but simply by the way, the, or, or by the first story that was picked to communicate to the developers, your, your analysis has been influenced, has been affected by this. You have a different structural model. And this, um, of course, this is not a big deal in this case, but in more realistic, uh, more complex problems, I think this is a, a, a big deal. So this is not really um, behavior-driven development. This is, I call this pseudo-behavioral, because if you look at it again, it's not describing behavior, it's mostly describing state. Given I have a product, given that product has a price, that's just describing structures, right? That's describing a state, not the behavior of how this uh, got to that state. So it imposes this structural model in your, uh, in your mind. So another way to have written this would have been as a proper story, explaining behavior over time as a shopper in order to buy stuff. Given the shop owner has priced a product at this is a very subtle uh, nuance, but what we're describing here is something that has happened, as opposed to the current state of the system, right? You can imagine this being uh, a bunch more givens, where it's given this has happened, and given that has happened, and given that has happened, when I do this, then I expect that that will have happened as a consequence of that. So you're actually describing um, events over time. You're describing this has happened and this has happened, and the actual state of that is not important. The actual structure that we use to represent the state that is the outcome of these events is not important in this story. So it's not affecting you uh, as, a, as a developer. And I have a more concrete case um, from a client where this was in fact a problem. Um, they had this, this system where um, a year in production they, they experienced some bugs. And this was how they started explaining what the system was doing. It was an online education system. And they were telling teachers have multiple courses, each with multiple modules, and students have multiple courses, you know, and then they get grades on the courses, etc. Um, so the, the problem, well, uh, so, well, these are sort of the heuristics that we can ask. This is sort of a more concrete version of those 
three Bs. It's asking what changes in the system. Why does it change? Under what circumstances? Who changes it? And how often does it change? And most importantly, what are the consequences of changes? If you just look at structure, you don't see this. If you ask these questions, and maybe you will. Um, they hadn't asked these questions. They had only built the system as a whole bunch of uh, objects and tables and, and CRUD operations on that. So basically, state and structure. Uh, but what they were seeing in production, one year into production, that uh, teachers started uh, after a course had been designed um, and uh, it went into production and students were taking the course and getting grades. And the teachers were sometimes making modifications to the course, uh, adding and, and removing modules. But what they hadn't thought about is what happens with students who already took some of the modules within a course, but didn't finish the whole course yet. They got some of the grades, they got some partial grades maybe already, and suddenly people start removing modules. So these grades just disappeared, right? People started complaining, and it took a while for them to understand uh, what was really happening, because they had no model of this. They had a very structural model. They had no model that explained to them, no mental model, and no visual model that explained to him how, how the system behaved over time. So if they had done temporal modeling, I expect that they would have uh, prevented or detected this problem uh, up front. And again, it's a simple example, but that's uh, because we lack the time for the real examples or the real case studies. So um, I want to introduce this concept a little bit, event sourcing. Who has heard of it? Who has applied it in real projects? Almost nobody. Um, it's not that hard actually. It takes there's not enough tooling around, and it's it's a bit new, and there's not not a lot of good documentation. Um, but the principle is very sound. It's very good. It's, it's actually a very mature idea. It's the idea that um, instead of representing state an artifact with state, we can actually store all the events that have happened that lead up to the state in an event store. Basically, a database with nothing but events a huge timeline, a history of events. And if you have these events, of course, you can calculate state from it. Of course, if you have not heard of event sourcing, then this may sound like it's a very expensive thing and very problematic in terms of building real systems. But these problems have actually been solved. Uh, it's actually very easy because this event store, this history is an immutable append-only history. So any calculation that you do, you can cheaply cache them, etc. So you can actually make this very performant. This was invented for uh, high frequency trading, in fact. Uh, well, I say invented, but it was sort of remixed or reused, because this idea is very old. This is how um, banks work. This is how your accountant works. You know, you have a ledger where every transaction is basically a domain event. It's immutable. If you make a mistake, you're not going to remove a line in the ledger. That would be illegal. You have to add a new one that corrects the previous one. So it's always event only. You never uh, mutate this history. Um, so, and this is uh, this is basically what it does. It, uh, an object is, in, in its simplest, most naive description, it's uh, an object. Instead of uh, remembering its own state, it remembers all the changes that lead up to the state. Uh, Git also works like this, basically. Something you do know. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail there. But from it, so event sourcing sort of grew in the domain-driven design community, um, and and people started taking these principles, started taking principles from uh, game storming and visualization, etc., and applying that to events and saying, what if we need to model a problem? Uh, what if we take these events as our because they're the first-class citizens in our in our system now in our in our domain model? What if we also make them first-class citizens when trying to communicate about the system? So you have to, event storming is basically a collaboration technique. You have to imagine getting into a room with some, with the customer and maybe some domain experts, non-technical people. And what you're doing is writing down these domain events. That's where you start. You write down a whole bunch of them. And I can actually, I have done sessions where I've covered like three times this much uh, amount of space with, with post-its. So it's, it's very cheap, it's very easy to do. In half a day you can model a very complex domain. Um, and it's very interactive, you can just do it with multiple people at the same time, you can move stuff. So it's very easy to do um, experiments on your model. And like if, if you have somebody, if, if you for example were to draw a model in, in visual with you know, nice diagrams, somebody works on that for two weeks and then somebody comes in and says this is wrong, they're going to hate you. But with this it's so cheap to make changes, you just go there and say hey but what happens if this happens first? 
or what happens if this happens twice? You can just move them around. So that's, um, that's basically events. I'm, I'm going to try to show uh, what the process actually looks like. Um, so, I'm not, so normally this would be a post-it where I would write invoice or spade on the, on the actual post-it. So we're using uh, orange for uh, domain events. So a domain event is something that has happened in the past. That's why, I, in fact, in my code, I write, I would write invoice was paid, not invoice paid or not uh, payment event or invoice event or something. Just the pure business language. You know, this is one of the things that makes it uh, accessible to domain experts, to, to non-technical people. Because it's just English, it's just human language. Invoice was paid, this has happened. I just put it there and I, I wrote a little envelope because it is in fact a message. If we model this in our system, this is just a message, a small immutable little object that you can pass around, that you can put on, an, on a message bus, on, an, on a queue, uh, that you can send to somewhere else, just informing the listeners uh, that something has happened. And uh, you can imagine that there's some uh, attributes in there, maybe um, some amounts and some dates and some user ID, this kind of stuff. So it's just a small little object. Um, so we're representing basically a time, right? You know, I told you we were going to do temporal modeling, so this is it. So the question that we're asking is, um, what happened before? You know, this is we start with an with a, a, an event that is of interest to the business. Invoice was paid. You can verify this with the business. Are you interested in invoices getting paid? Well, well obviously. So the next thing is command. It's Something that caused this to happen, you know, causation. It's very, it's very Newtonian, cause and effect. So something caused this event to happen. That's another message. Somebody sent a message to the system. Again, a very, very simple example. Uh, somebody sent a message to the system saying, pay for this invoice. You know, do this, do that, imperative, right? So that's a command. You use a different color post-it for it, and you just show it. Uh, so that's cause and effect. Um, so normally you would, uh, when you do event storming, you would probably have a lot of events first and then start looking for the commands and then you find some more events, uh, etc. So here I'm again doing a very condensed uh, version. So next thing we're going to ask is, um, can this command fail for some reason? Um, of course there could be technical reasons, database connection lost, whatever. Uh, that's not something, something we're going to model here. Uh, we're trying to not scare away uh, the domain experts. Um, we're trying to extract information from them. So we ask them why would this fail, right? There's some business rule in between there. There's some constraints, some invariants that might uh, prevent this command from doing the thing that we want it to do. Uh, for example, it could be that the amount is wrong, right? Um, so I would write this on the, on the yellow post-it. That's the business rule explaining. Uh, it's basically a branch, you know, the way I model it. So there's now two possible outcomes for this command. Somebody sends this command, the amount could be equal to the expected amount, so the outcome is invoice was paid, or it could be too low and then the invoice was partially paid. Right? Again, we have to ask the domain experts. We're always looking for what the business really needs, what they really, uh, how they understand uh, their needs, and we're trying to model that. So we're not trying to make our own version. If they tell us that they refuse uh, partial payments, then of course that's what we're going to write here. But I suspect most businesses would not refuse partial payments. Uh, they'd rather get you know, the money they can get uh, right now. Um, what I like about writing down business rules very explicitly is that they can show you what is missing. Right? If you have a little bit of a mathematical brain, you should already have noticed that there's a, a third possible case here. It could be that the amount is too much Again, of course, in a realistic system, maybe this would be uh, using some payment provider and you cannot have wrong amounts, etc. Again, uh, this is just an example. But I have had cases where by writing down the business rules explicitly, we figured out that there were, in fact, more cases that we hadn't thought of. So here it could be that the invoice was overpaid. Right? Um, and then the next, uh, what I like to uh, annotate on my, on my model, is uh, sort of the end of a life cycle, the end of a process. So of course it could be that when the invoice is uh, overpaid, that the process also ends. Um, 
because the domain expert says, yeah, when somebody pays us too much, we just you know, ignore it. Uh, I don't recommend that, but some people might. More realistically, probably the amount would be booked on the next invoice, or there would be some other process starting here, a reimbursement process. Um, but in any case, the, the one in the middle, invoice was paid, that's the end of this process. That's where this life cycle ends of this, of this thing. Um, and of course, when it's partially paid at the top, there would be something else. We'll get to that in a moment. So the next thing we can ask is, uh, this business rule, this, has, this needs some knowledge. This needs to know what has happened before in order to make decisions, right? We could model it like this, visualize it like this with an arrow. Um, but then when we start visualizing this, we start uh, figuring out that there's a problem here because we cannot just depend on the command. The command is basically a message that the user sent us. And we cannot expect uh, something coming from a client to have the paid amount, but also the invoice amount, because then, of course, you could spoof this system. You could send a message saying, uh, pay for the invoice, pay one euro, and, <coughs> oh, by the way, the invoice amount was one euro. Um, so this information comes from somewhere else. You know, this, this backend already needs to know it. This business rule already needs to know it. So there was some event that happened before. So this is sort of, we're, we're always sort of working backwards and then working forwards and changing directions to figure out what we have missed in this uh, event storming process. So this business rule really needs to know two things. It needs to know something that has happened first, customer was invoiced, that's maybe the, the event that starts off this process, uh, as well as the, the fact that somebody, you know, the, the command, someone <coughs> trying to, to pay for this invoice. And then, of course, we can go back another step and say, where does this uh, new event come from? Well, it comes from another command, invoice customer, probably sent by some salesperson, etc. And this could be the start of the process. Realistically, again, this could be a much longer process with different people involved, sending different events, etc. Um, we had the event at the top saying invoice was partially paid. There's something happens after that, right? It's again uh, pay for invoice. There's again a business rule. There's again three possible outcomes. But if we visualize um, the dependencies now, so you could just say, you know, it's the same thing, recurse back to the beginning, something like that. But again, this is one of these cases where by visualizing explicitly that there is repetition going on, you sometimes detect that it's a little bit more complex than you thought. Because here, the knowledge that the business rule requires to make decisions to decide on this, this branch is not just the, tweet, the two previous things, the command and event, but also what happened at the beginning. So we can actually rephrase the business rule now and say it's the sum of all the paid amounts needs to equal um, the invoice amount. Um, so again, this is, I'm, I'm trying to illustrate why this sort of temporal modeling looking for knowledge dependencies gives us uh, sometimes clues that we might have missed. This kind of simple example, you would have figured it out while programming, but for the more complex ones, you don't figure this out while programming directly because you're too, too detailed at this point. Um, and in fact here, also by doing the repetition we detect that there's actually two messages there. Because we had, here we had an invoice was partially paid, and then we got another payment in, and then we got another invoice was partially paid, and then the combination of those two actually results in the invoice was paid when you know, the amount is now correct. This is important because if, um, if we had only sent this one, then any event listener, maybe some external system listening to these events, would have not known that the invoice was paid. Or it would have uh, had um, you know, the common sense to add up all the numbers, starting from uh, the customer was invoiced, invoice was partially paid, invoice was partially paid, make that sum and discover this on its own. But this would imply that the listener also is aware of the same business rule, the same business rule that all the amounts need to add up. Of course, this is again a simple one, but um, what you don't really want is uh, a system where all the players have to know everything about each other. That's very bad encapsulation, right? Single responsibility, dry, etc. All these uh, principles sort of play into the same idea. So we can actually prevent this by saying, you know, there's two invoices with partially paid events, but we also say, Hey guys, uh, this invoice is now fully paid. So if you are an event listener and you're only interested in this one, you don't have to care about the others, you don't have to uh, 
uh, know this, this business rule, basically. Of course you could, if you have uh, maybe some analytics that wants to analyze payment behavior of customers, uh, you could do this kind of thing. That, uh, then you could listen to these partially paid events as well. So what we have now, um, this is sort of, you know, again, the traditional UML style uh, entity relationship diagrams. We have different primitives now to do our visualizations. Right? We have something very tangible, we have time, we have knowledge uh, going backwards in time. Uh, we have constraints or business rules, we have a history, you know, evolution. Uh, we have intentions or commands or causations of people doing stuff resulting in things. We have branching, uh, we have these sort of groups of things that form logical processes because they have a beginning and an end, right? Um, so we have a whole different way of looking at this thing. We have a very easy way to visualize it. We have actually been programming with these non-technical people, but don't tell them, you know. Um, and we could actually annotate this with uh, a lot more information. Uh, we could add uh, the actors who is doing this. Uh, we could add, add queries. Queries are basically messages that fetch state from the system. Um, so, for example, give me a list of all the unpaid invoices, etc. Yeah, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, when you have sort of complex systems, you might uh, find a balance between making some things immediately consistent and some things uh, eventually consistent and resolving them over time, etc. Um, so basically what, what Weinberg says is, you know, this is not uh, the only way of looking at the system. There's, you always need the two views, you always need the static view, what are the structures? And you need to dynam the dynamic view. What, how do, how do these evolve, or how does uh, the system behave over time? Um, sit first. Is this making sense so far? I don't think I'm saying really complex stuff so far. Um, I want to go a little bit deeper in um, a sort of recurring pattern. When you start thinking about processes. What we find is that there's always the same kind of pattern going on, where there is some process with some... So I simplified it again. I didn't have all the commands and business rules and branches off here. Just imagine that this could be a complex process that um, ends at some point. It results in an artifact. Uh, so this is an artifact in the middle. Some document, something, some structure. And then it, this kicks off some new process. So this first process is collaborative construction, we call it. It's very often different people involved into building something over time, building this up, agreeing on it. Um, then you have this artifact. And then this artifact starts a new process that we call execution, where something, some things actually happen over time that are sort of the purpose of this, of this artifact. The, we could say that the artifact uh, prescribes this execution process. So if we take the example of invoice, it could be, I said it before, it could be that this invoice was built over time with a bunch of people, uh, maybe salesperson adds some things, maybe the account manager needs to add um, uh, the customer details, uh, maybe somebody from product needs to add prices, I don't know. So, and maybe at the end some, somebody signs off on it, maybe the CFO puts their signature on it and now it's official. Now we start changing it, now we have the artifact, and we send it. So that's the end of the, of the, of the drafting process, the sign-off, and then sending this invoice to the customer is the start of the execution process, of the invoicing process, where the goal is, of course, to, to get our money. We can see this, so in traditional object oriented, you would probably model this as one big invoice object. Here we're seeing this as, a, in fact, two processes. One where we're building this thing, then we have it, and then we send it up and stuff happens to it. Hopefully we get paid over time, maybe we don't get paid, we need to send some reminders, we need to send a lawyer, etc. That's, that's a process. Um, and we have the same thing like with the, the course design, where teachers design a course, they have the course and then uh, the, the students are taking the course. Um, yeah, another example from uh, warehousing. Um, yeah, I'll just skip that one. Uh, insurance, in insurance, this, these processes could actually take years. Well, maybe not the negotiation. Well, if you're just like a, a regular customer for uh, an insurance contract, you'd probably just get the contract and read it and sign it. That's not a very involved collaborative uh, construction process. 
But if you are a big company and you need some very complex uh, insurance, this might take a couple of weeks or months where different people are sort of building up this contract and then agreeing on it in the end. We have the contract now, and this prescribes how a claim will be handled. So it might take this in between here, there might be 10 years before something is claimed, but then a claim happens. And this document, this contract prescribes, these are the steps that, uh, how this, uh, about how this, this, this uh, claim will be, will be handled. Um, so, and there's actually a, a third phase in there, a third uh, archetype, where we're actually monitoring this. And because we're storing all these events, um, tracking or auditing or monitoring or analysis become very elegant, in fact. We know everything that has happened at every point in time, the same way that your accountant knows all the transactions. Um, with the example that I didn't explain about warehouse management, uh, I have a client where they need to know everything exactly about who moved frozen food out of the truck into this location, put it in this freezer, got it out, etc. They need to know all of this. They need to be able to prove this. By storing the events, we can, in fact, and uh, use this information to maybe even improve our uh, construction process. So this is called three archetypes. Uh, it's also some sort of a heuristic, some sort of rule of thumb or some way of looking at the system and saying, do I have these three archetypes? Have I missed something? You know, can I separate this? Even if you're not doing event sourcing but object-oriented, you could use this to say, well, instead of making one huge uh, like God class for invoice, can I make smaller classes? One for the construction of the invoice, one for the artifact, the actual document, uh, one for the process of, of getting our money. And then maybe some other thing that analyzes uh, if you want to know, you know payment behavior of, of customers. Um, I'm running a bit out of time, but I want to show a little bit that uh, why this is so, so useful, uh, or if you're not convinced yet. So this invoicing process might in fact have some policies where we say, you know, um, if it's a good customer, then we will give them a little bit more time to pay. We're going to do a gentle phone call, very friendly. Um, with other customers, we might be very aggressive and send uh, written reminders, like on the day that the invoice expires, etc., uh, or gets overdue. And in, in very, in most simple scenarios, this would just be some internal policy where uh, maybe the CFO just sends an email to the credit controller saying, you know, this is how we do, uh, this is how we treat these customers. A very informal uh, policy. But this could also be encoded in the system. We could program this to say, you know, we detect that this is a uh, customer of type A, so this is how we treat them. So this, this policy, this artifact, prescribes also the invoicing process. Um, and then, of course, if, if we have uh, an even more complex environment, different people might be changing this policy over time. They might be changing the rules. They might be saying, from now on, if we, uh, if we have a customer of more than 100,000 euros, then we will take this very slow, gentle invoicing process, etc. So we can sort of start modeling. This is a, a collaborative construction process that affects an execution process while it's being executed, or it might affect it. Um, and this is the same problem that we had with, uh, if you remember, the students taking courses and the course being changed, etc. We now have a way of actually visualizing this. What happens if the course changes while some student is already taking the course? Here I drew it as uh, nothing should happen. So basically we're saying here that the course stays stable for existing students and new students get a new version of the course. Of course this is a bit more involved uh, to develop. But at least we have sort of defined the behavior of our system instead of just having this, you know, who knows what will happen kind of uh, attitude. Um, so uh, again, this is the warehouse management example. With uh, insurance, this is even uh, a much bigger problem because this, these things actually take years. This is not like some student taking a course which takes maybe a few weeks or months. But here, the products change all the time. They are, um, you know, marketing people are always changing their insurance product. The inter internal policies change. What if there is a lot of cases of fraud? Then it would probably change their fraud detection policies. But this could change while some three-year running uh, claim is still going on. So we want explicit ways to model how this affects things. 
And this is very cheap to do because all we have been using so far is just some post-its. It's very, very attractive to, uh, to non-technical people. Um, so for the people who want to get into event sourcing, etc., uh, this is getting quite advanced. For most event sourcing, you can actually do it. most scenarios will be simple anyway. But if you do, um, well, maybe find the slides on my on my website. There's some ideas you could inject a specification <coughs> object into uh, another uh, another process, um, etc. Well, I'm not going to go into detail. But the idea is that with, with event sourcing, you would probably for uh, immediately consistent processes, you would use an aggregate to model those. For uh, eventually consistent processes, you could use process managers that allow you to adapt to changes uh, after they have happened. So the point is, to get back to the beginning, when you have some complex business problems, um, most businesses operate in time. It's not just some, some static data, you know? So you, you want to have some way of, of visualizing these models. And this is the easiest and, and fastest way I have found uh, so far with event sourcing and event storing uh, specifically. So I can't talk about time without uh, quoting Einstein, of course. The only reason for time is so that everything uh, doesn't happen at once. Uh, so if time matters, model time. No. Are there any questions? Is the BPMN a good tool for, for this? Uh, I have not a lot of experience with that, but uh, I think it's more coarse, I think it's more business oriented. Here, you still end up with a very... Um, so, uh, in, with, with um, business process modeling, it's, it's, it's coarse, you don't have... Uh, it's from the business point of view. Here, it's very precise, because with event sourcing, when you implement this kind of visual modeling code, you just basically copy all the events and commands and business rules make objects for them, and then you have all the all the basic basic building blocks of your of your model. So it's a, a lot more close to to what the system will actually look like. Whereas with business process modeling, it's sort of distant. And uh, one one comparison that a friend of mine gave was that um, if you are sort of superficially looking at it, a wedding could be a, an event. It's something that happens. But um, if you look at it closely, a wedding is not an event. It's a very long process of lots of events from planning to execution to aftermath. Um, with event sourcing, you, you would tend to go into uh, enough detail so that every event that matters to the business actually ends up into, into the system. But as I said, I don't have experience with business process modeling, so I don't have, uh, like, I, I cannot compare really. But it's related. Any other questions? Um, for me, the, the most interesting part is, uh, like the last slides that you mentioned, with these um, processes that um, kind of influence each other. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for reading or like um, examples, like how to solve that in practice? Uh, not much, I'm afraid. Um, so, well, the. In, in fact, it's just using existing design patterns. If you've read uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans, things like uh, specifications, they are just small objects that can answer a question about another object. So one thing you could do is just have this, this set of policies generate this, this sort of spe specification or, or configure a specification and then just inject this object into the aggregate, for example, that needs to make this decision. But um, yeah, there's this, uh, apart from these four slides, there's nothing I'm aware of uh, on the internet at all describing this kind of thing. Uh, so I should probably write about it and, and write some examples. Here, this is maybe the simplest version where you just inject it. So every, every process, all the events that happen over time, they have a version number simply because this event happened after that one. So maybe here I change the policy. So this policy is now at version two. So I could start a new process for let's say this, the top one is an, uh, is an insurance claim. And I'm saying this insurance claim starts using version two of the policy. So every time the business rule needs to make a decision, it can query 
the policy and say, okay, policy, I want to know what you would have done with this decision if when you were at version two. But this is very easy to do now because we have all the events. This is sort of a, a, a time machine. We have all the state changes. The same way we get, you can look at how did my code behave at this version of the code. We can sort of implement something like that in our code and say, okay, object, I will build you up to version two. I ignore these events. And now I ask you to do something using your configuration that you have right now at version two. Does that make sense? So that's probably what you would use most of the time, because most of the time, in fact, you would keep the version stable for the whole process. If I start invoicing a customer right now, and uh, tomorrow I decide that I will become more aggressive, then maybe for these customers that are already that already received an invoice, I would still do it the old way. Right? It's only for usually only for longer processes like insurance, where this starts to matter, where you want to be able to. Um, sort of keep affecting the, the decisions when the policies change and do this in a very controlled way uh, because there's legal implications, there's regulations, etc. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's not a lot written about it, but it's, it's actually not as hard as, as I make it look maybe. Uh, because it's just some, some object is configured to make a decision in a certain way and some other object simply asks this object, you know, make this decision for me. It's just delegation. So there's, it's, it's basically polymorphic because that business rule is not, it's sort of depending on a, like a strategy object and telling it to do something or telling it to do, asking it to make a decision and then communicating that decision as the new event, as the new outcome. I hope that helps a little bit. Okay. Uh, I guess we're out of time. Thank you for listening.